North went on forever. Tyrion Lannister knew the maps as well as anyone, but a fortnight on the wild track that passed for the King's Road up here had brought home the lesson that the map was one thing and the land quite another. Hi everybody, welcome to another re-reading A Song of Ice and Fire video and today I'm gonna dive deep into Tyrion's second chapter in A Game of Thrones as he's on his way north from Winterfell to the Wall with Jon Snow and others. And we learn so much about who Tyrion and Jon are. But before I dive into the chapter, I'd like to talk to you guys about our Patreon page. I am so thankful for our patrons. We have more patrons than most of the channels out there. We even have more patrons than channels that have two, three, four, five, seven times the subscriber counts that we have. And I'm very, very proud of that. So that says a lot about the kind of support that we're getting. And I cannot be thankful enough because this is the only way that the channel is being sustained. YouTube money, that's coffee money, barely. No sponsors. Your support is basically what would make this thing keep going. Okay, whatever. Let's go back to the video. Also, subscribe if you want to get our future rereading videos. So right at the beginning of the chapter, we encounter a familiar theme in this book, which is very apparent in this Tyrion chapter. The tensions between fact and fiction. Bedtime stories and reality. The tracks on the map are one thing. Walking those tracks quite another. Another recurring theme in this chapter is lessons learned. This is the 13th chapter of the book and aside from the prologue we have not read about any supernatural occurrence. We are like Tyrion now. We know that there was magic way way in the past but we barely remember it and we might start to believe that the others are like Tyrion says nothing but grumpkins and snarks stories that wet nurses told children growing up. So the two major characters in this chapter are obviously John and Tyrion, but there's another significant character, the North. The North went on forever. Those are the first words of this chapter. Things start to look very different. Woods get denser, hills turn to mountains, trees are older and darker than Tyrion had ever seen. It's also quieter, well, except for the constant howling of the wolves during the night. And of course, it gets colder. This northern land is rugged and tough and ominous. It's uninviting. It's scarcely populated. And the King's Road got lonely. And we're talking about the main highway of the realm. People up here don't live in towns. No, no, no. So far up north they live in holdfasts and in farms along streams. Then they get to the wolf's wood and it gets even wilder. And they have to camp outside and count on their own resources. One of the resources that Tyrion has is wine from the Summer Isles that he brought all the way up north. So even when we're in this dreary, cold place, we are reminded how massive this world is. There's so much of it. So there's a group of people going up north. It includes Tyrion, Benjen, Jon, a couple of Lannister soldiers to protect Tyrion, and later a brother of the Night's Watch called Yorin, and a couple of new recruits and Ghost. That's nine overall. And Tyrion thinks that they make a curious fellowship, which is an apparent reference to the fellowship of the ring that travels east in Lord of the Rings. Hmm. But while the latter fellowship was honorable and just, this one in the Game of Thrones could not be more different. As if he is trying to tell us that these two epic fantasy tales are worlds apart. I liked how Tyrion described this party. He says that he is headed north, and I quote, with Benjen Stark and his nephew. To emphasize the hierarchy, right? Benjen is essential. The nephew, mm. So Tyrion, like we noticed in his first chapter, he is a learned man. He reads a lot in Winterfell, and now he reads a lot while they're on the road. Tyrion has an exciting talk with Jon, which is my favorite part of the chapter. 
John is a curious dude. He wanders about this bizarre fellow who's a Lannister on the one hand, and no one in Winterfell likes those people. But on the other hand, Tyrion does seem like a kind and thoughtful dude in some respects. A different kind of bloke. So John is suspicious of him, but that doesn't stop him from striking a conversation. Asking him out of the blue why he reads so much. So Tyrion responds to the question with his own question. He's schooling the young boy. Look at me and tell me what do you see. John doesn't know what to say. He's, he thinks it's a trick question. And here we get to observe Tyrion in action, talking, thinking, observing, deducting. We've yet to see any of the other characters in action doing what they do best. Hmm? We've just heard stories about the prowess of Ned and Robert or Jamie, but here we do get to see Tyrion fight on his own terms, with his own weapons. He's playing with John by belittling him. When John answers, I see Tyrion Lannister. Tyrion responds, you are remarkably polite for a bastard, Snow. So it's a compliment, you're polite. <laughs> Thank you. But then he calls him a bastard, twice. Once by directly calling him a bastard, and then by calling him Snow, which means Bastard of the North. That's a jab right there. What you see is a dwarf, Tyrion continues. So he's talking about, about his biggest weakness. Without hesitation, but immediately counters with another jab. You are what? 12? Tyrion goes on. I have a realistic grasp of my strengths and weaknesses. Oof, won't we all like to have a realistic grasp of our strengths and weaknesses? Hmm? Know our own worth, to say it plainly. So Tyrion lets John in on what it's like to be a weak and physically deformed dwarf with difficulties walking and riding. And his point is, my mind is my weapon. My brother has his sword, King Robert has his warhammer, and I have my mind. And the mind needs books as a sword needs a whetstone if it's to keep its edge. Beautiful writing, Mr. Martin. It shows us that Tyrion is a serious and dedicated person in spite of his grotesque look. Having a realistic grasp means that Tyrion knows he's lucky. He's been lucky to be born and raised privileged. Because, he says, had he not been a Lannister, he would have been killed or sold off. So he's into intersectionality. He checks his privileges. Tyrion thinks to himself that John has chosen a hard life. And then he corrects himself <laughs> that this hard life was chosen for him. So Tyrion is super sharp. Tyrion wasn't there in the room when the decision was made to ship John off to Winterfell. But he added two and two together and deducted what actually happened. That's impressive. So this is why he says his mind is like a weapon. And he uses it as a weapon in this conversation with John. You could say that he's showing John some tough love, forcing him to look at his reality with open eyes. So Tyrion teases John about how the Starks must have been fantastic to him, how Caitlyn was undoubtedly super lovely, and Rob too, because John was never a threat to get Winterfell ahead of Rob. So Rob could afford to be nice. And then Tyrion tells him, your father must have good reasons for packing you off to the Night's Watch. Ah, oof, that's a real gut punch right there. Mm. Tyrion fashions himself as a sort of mentor slash Thor mentor. Ha, huh? nice, right? <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so one of Tyrion's superpowers is logic. And this logic leads him to make fun of people who believe in silly stories about monsters in the north. Monsters? Come on, let's be serious, let's be logical. Where are these monsters? But Tyrion's logic is flawed because he has himself seen proof that monsters exist. Because Tyrion is obsessed and has a morbid fascination with dragons. He has read about them. And when he first got to King's Landing, I quote, he had made it a point to seek out the dragon skulls that hung on the walls of the Targaryen's throne room. Tyrion read about them, and now he wants to see them with his own eyes. That's logical. Hmm? 
He knew the north from looking at the maps and then actually went there to see what it's like. He has read the history and properties of dragons. He wants to experience knowledge with his senses. Absorb it. But he's not a 21st century person who's a citizen of the world. He's an aristocrat from medieval times who loves living the good life. No other character in this story goes off trekking to the wall just for the heck of it. Hmm? There are no online forums to get tips or to share your experiences with others. Going to the wall is not a thing that people do. Tyrion is, is just odd. And that makes him my favorite character early on in this wonderful story. So Tyrion goes down to the dungeons of King's Landing to see the dragon skulls. And every detail is laid out in the chapter to show us what kind of an experience it was for him. And how he remembers everything to this very day. Seeing the dragon skulls had a powerful impact on him. And he was imagining that the skulls like the fire in his torch. And he played with them thought the skulls were watching him. And they're huge! Their mouths are big enough to swallow whole humans or aurochs. Tyrion also has dragon dreams, which are the kindling in the fire that is Tyrion is a Targaryen theories. And he used to stare into the flames for hours, imagining his father and sister burning. Watching the fire for hours? Hmm, that reminds me of something that we'll see so are those images he imagined foreshadowing? His dad burning could be the burning of the Tower of the Hand by Cersei after Tywin's death. And Cersei burning could be her fate at the end of the story, burned by Daenerys and her dragons, and maybe by wildfire that she and the Mad King have hidden all throughout the city. Maybe her last words too will be, burn them all. He talks about how big and old they were once upon a time. While the last ones were kind of defective and small, this echoes another significant theme in the story. One of a glorious past that is long lost. It's a very human feeling, being nostalgic about the days of old. It's a, it's a clever play actually because that glorious past in the story is the more conventional fantasy world. Honorable knights, incredible conquerors, fellowships and dragons that are bigger than life. He is telling us that this Tolkien-like fantasy world is a thing of the past, is no more, is dead, deceased. This is another story. This guy who just loves to talk stood there watching wordless and odd. This was his reaction to seeing their skulls. So imagine what it felt like watching them alive. He does call them monsters, but surprisingly found them beautiful. So Tyrion has a relationship with the dragons. This logical person has seen with his own eyes that illogical creatures exist in the world. These dragons are magic incarnate and Tyrion can't logically explain that. We can ask the question, what's the difference between the dragons and grumpkins and snarks and all the other monsters your wet nurse warned you about? Could be that the difference is that the dragons are grumpkins that Tyrion has seen proof of that they exist with his own eyes. So that Bigfoot is real, but the others, no pun intended, are not real. They don't exist because Tyrion hasn't seen them. That's a kind of a flawed logic. Fire Bigfoot, yes. Ice Bigfoot, no. So to make sense of all this, Tyrion has had to forget about these childish notions of dragons. Forget your dreams, grow up, life is hard, and there's no room for daydreaming. By the way, Benjen Stark has ventured beyond the wall, and he definitely believes that Icy Bigfoot exists. He, and he was actually worried that the others have taken John because John didn't call him to say he'll be coming back late to the camp. So we're still on the right side of the wall. And Benjen thinks that the others are operating right there in Starkland. So he's not very well informed for a head ranger. Nah. Anyway, it's so awesome that in this story, there are drawbacks to being a learned and informed person. There are drawbacks to not believing in grumpkins and snarks, because those could be real. There are facts, 
But some of the facts could be fake news. So through Tyrion's eyes, we learn about the history of the dragons in the field of fire. When Tyrion recounts the story, he adds a little grain of salt about the numbers in the armies. When it said that Aegon the Dragon Lord had a fifth of the soldiers and mounted knights compared to his enemies on the field, Tyrion adds, the chroniclers say, and then again a few lines later. It's so often the case in history that we cannot know exactly what happened in wars and battles of the past. It could be that these facts in the field of fire were changed in order to glorify even further Aegon's great victory with his three dragons. The name of the battle, the field of fire, was given by singers, who are oral popular historians, also agents of collective memory. They probably sang those songs in Aegon's court. And the chroniclers, the historians, we can assume that they wrote history for him, his own history, because the Seven Kingdoms, we learn in this chapter, with Aegon's conquest, were turned from mere provinces into one kingdom. Me, sort of. Let's talk about John for a minute. When Tyrion schools him, he says about John, the boy absorbed that all in silence. So John is eager to learn, like Tyrion. And Tyrion also says that John's face was very stark, long, solemn, guarded, a face that gave away nothing. So this is what the Starks look like to Southerners. And by the way, this is the second or third time that someone says about John that he has a great poker face. So this part is really funny in rereading, because Tyrion says that there was nothing in John from his mother's side. Tyrion thinks obviously that John's father is Ned, but knowing that John's father is actually Rhaegar, most of Rhaegar was left in the genetic editing room floor. So John has his own fantasy collide with reality regarding the Night's Watch. John imagined it as an honorable calling, but here in this chapter he sees that it's not populated by honorable men. Hmm? He plays again with fantasy tropes, with the way Tyrion describes Yorin as a sinister, stooped, hard man. And you can't even see his face behind his wild beard full of lies. This is the honorable calling? No, this is how you would describe a standard bad guy in a usual fantasy story. Dirty and ugly. So again, dreams of honor meet cold hard truth. The Watch is a penal colony. But instead of sending murderers to nice and warm Australia, they're sending them to Siberia. Instead of Benjens, the watch is made up of stinking stooped Yoren. And those are the better bunch at the wall because the others are more like the two rapers who opted for the wall instead of castration. So that's the real Night's Watch. Not the watch from the stories and songs that the chroniclers say or from the stories that wet nurses told rich kids about. The Night's Watch, who is charged in protecting the realm, is manned by grumpkins and snarks of the humankind. They actually look more like monsters than the others, who are described as beautiful and white and clean. So he's telling John, you're joining a penal colony. Your only crime? Being a bastard. John is livid at that. This is the second time Tyrion gives John a lesson about using his weakness as a shield or a weapon. But then something interesting happens. Tyrion underestimates the boy. John has something to teach him too about grumpkins and snarks and other monsters. I'm quoting, he never saw the wolf. The damned thing never made a sound. Ghost knocked him down in a second. It's actually similar to when John got up close to Tyrion as he was reading. John didn't make a sound either. So Tyrion is flat on the ground and he asks John for help. And here John uses his direwolf first as a weapon, knocking him down, and now literally as a shield because Ghost gets between them to protect John, like a shield. As if John wanted to beat Tyrion up. And Ghost did it for him. And like Tyrion, John is not done with the lesson he gives to the dwarf. He's like, I'm happy to learn from you. 
but you have to learn how to be nice to me. And Tyrion, he has long learned how to control his anger. Otherwise, as an imp, he would not have survived. So he says, I should be very grateful for your kind assistance, John. Not Snow or Bastard. John. And then they share a laugh. So the tension is relieved. And Tyrion treats John with more respect and even offers him some wine. And I'm left with the question, isn't the direwolf a grumpkin or a snark? Hmm? John is a fast learner, definitely. After at first rejecting Tyrion's facts about the watch, now that John is less guarded and no longer feels threatened by this little grumpkin, he evolves and accepts the truth. And for that, Tyrion compliments him for accepting all truths rather than deny them. And they both agree that they are awesome and not like other men in that regard. Okay, let's talk about Benjen, who seemed to share his brother's distaste for Lannisters, and that Benjen had not been pleased when Tyrion had told him of his intentions to go up north. So Benjen tells Tyrion, I warn you, Lannister, there are no inns at the wall, Benjen had said, looking down on him. Ugh. Looking down on him, what a dick. Honorable Benjamin Stark seems entirely different now, from Tyrion's eyes. He looks like an asshole. He is bigoted against Lannisters. He forms a strong and negative opinion about Tyrion just because of his last name. So when Benjamin pushes the point, telling him there are no inns at the wall, Tyrion exhibits great self-deprecating humor. And he quips, no doubt you'll find some place to put me. As you might have noticed, I'm small. Boom! Haha! <laughs> Using his weakness as a weapon, he shot Benjen up. But he's still a proud man. Tyrion did not want to complain about the hard right north so as not to give Benjen the satisfaction of knowing he was having a hard time after all. And even though we learn in Tyrion's first chapter that he's an outsider in his own family, he still wants to play a part for the honor of the house. He's not only well educated, he's also street smart. Benjen, being a Stark, is gallant. <laughs> and Tyrion takes advantage of it. When Benjen offers him a fur coat as a courtesy, thing that Tyrion will probably graciously decline. Nah, 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 nah. Tyrion readily accepts the offer as a small revenge against Benjen because, as Tyrion puts it, the Lannisters never declined, graciously or otherwise. The Lannisters took what was offered. That's a great line. My favorite of the chapter. So Tyrion is an outsider to the Lannisters, but he's still a Lannister through and through. He's cunning and will switch sides if that's what reality demands of him. So let's get to the conclusion and the arcs in the story. The chapter ends with Tyrion sharing his wine with everybody, which shows that he's becoming a part of the group. And John ends the chapter looking at the flames, like Tyrion did as a boy. Tyrion smiles sadly at that, thinking no doubt that the boy still believes in fairy tales and will need to grow up like he did. Tyrion says during this chapter about himself that he would make his own way, as he had all his life. And John too, looking at these flames, would make his own way, as he had all his life. Oof. Another great chapter. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.